Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Glad that you all made it. We're a little bit late today, but that's okay. Audio issues, imagine that. Who would have guessed? Good morning, Mr. Right. Toast. How are you? Yeah, good morning to everyone. I'm, I'm good. I am good. It's, it's Christ himself, rather than Tosh, right? <laughs> Yeah, so Christos did a Christos did a YouTube video, and YouTube uh, YouTube took his name and turned it in the auto uh, auto uh, closed captions and turned it to Christ himself. So and, and I my personally don't think that was an accident. But and since my status is elevated to that level, I think I'm gonna start charging for premium tweets from now on. So you friends, if you want to communicate with me from now on, you have to pay. I, I think my my Twitter counter now will just go. Boom down to two followers uh, you know what I, i'm not scared because out of the four thousand something followers i think four thousand are just uh, bots and random people just follow you know we you know when you ask a question on twitter and you're like i've got followers somebody can come back and in silence it's like, yeah. it's like do I even have any live organisms just following me, or is it just, just bots? Anyway. I just blame the algorithm, right? Oh, it could be. That's right. I, I mean, there's so much in there that it's highly unlikely that you'll catch some of these questions. But anyway, uh, no premium tweets for me, I promise. I will keep it uh, free for everyone. I am all for the community, you know? <laughs> something tells me... Something tells me that uh, that premium tweets will end up being the uh, <laughs> premium tweets are going to end up being the, um, <laughs> the 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 ego correction of our time. <laughs> There'll be a lot of people like, wait a minute, you mean people don't want to pay to hear my musings? <laughs> I know it's insane, right? Like, Although you know what, I will gladly pay Twitter if a premium or a fee to stop doing stupid ads. Like the target ads that you get every yep. three or four tweets. That's so annoying. Hey, man, I, I agree. I'll give I... you fifteen dollars and I want a medium where I can communicate my French. Sorry, sir. Am... Uh, yeah, no. Sa same thing here. I get these wonderful mobile game ads for all the time. I don't know <laughs> what I did to deserve those, but they're the really stupid ones where they show like a puzzle, and then then they're yeah. like, oh, no, like zero percent can solve this. It, it's yeah, it's the worst. Yeah, I, every time I, I saw one the other day, and it's like somebody doing a game the wrong way, and you're so com like you're looking at it, and you're so compelled to be like, no, you're doing it wrong. That's how they get you. Oh, you've been muted, man. <laughs> <laughs> Easy wildfire, a dimming stuff. Did you not create this kind of a? Are are you guys doing predictions on on this thing as well? I, I can can we like can we can we start doing like predictions on like will my code compile or something? <laughs> Except for you, you're the only one who can hear it, so we haven't even introduced you yet. Oh, oh nice. <laughs> okay, I guess my well, voice is back. I'm gonna introduce you quickly before uh, somebody before I end up getting muted again. So makes all the sense. Uh, anyway, so we've got. <laughs> So we have we have Sebastian here this morning from or from Jet Brains. It's very not morning for him, but it is morning at least for us. So uh, good morning. Yeah. Hi. Good. Good evening. Uh, I'm I'm Sebastian. <laughs> Sebastian uh, from yeah. the future. Yeah. So. Exactly. Uh, I, yeah. Let me tell you, like Friday Friday night is still a okay. Uh, you have a lot of good things to look forward to. <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. <laughs> That's good to know. Well, so on the, the one thing on Twitter before we go, uh, I am right now in a heated argument with about thirty five people on an email thread, and I need your votes to uh, prove uh -oh. to them that the internet thinks that they are also wrong the same way that I believe they are wrong. So uh, here's a link to a tweet. I need you to go read it and vote in it. And if you think that I'm wrong, I need you to tell me why. Because I cannot figure out how it is wrong. I've already voted so, for that. I, I was like your first vote. Okay, well, I'm convinced. 100% convinced that... Uh, oh, thanks, Frank, for bringing your for bringing your folks over. So what are hey, you guys hey. working on with Frank today? Blazer. So look, it's, pretty, it's a pretty straightforward ask. If you're familiar <laughs> with OpenID hybrid flow... <laughs> The mullet. Yeah. The mullet so of I'm, I'm, I'm just gonna. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. So uh. if you're if you're familiar with hybrid flow, in my opinion, hybrid flow without a secret is implicit flow with a different name, and we are very clear that you shouldn't use implicit flow. Um, 
and yet we say it's okay for hybrid flow, and I don't like that. So anyway, um, okay, so on to today. So today's show, so Sebastian uh, Sebastian will tell us all about what he does and where he works and everything else, but when, when we talked a few weeks ago, um, we get a ton of requests for things like, hey, can you build a Kotlin mobile app? Hey, can you build a Kotlin app with KTOR? Like we had... Um, we had a show on that probably a couple months ago. And um, we said, well, you know, like I've been doing like .NET primarily for a long time and JavaScript and stuff like that. And I thought it'd be cool to, to learn Kotlin for someone who has used another language or is familiar at least with other languages. And so that's what, uh, that's what we're going to get into today. So it's, um, it's, sort of a, it's sort of like a getting started. It's sort of an intro, but it's also sort of a... If you're familiar with writing software in other languages and you want to switch to Kotlin or you need to use it for a project or whatever, um, we've got we've got just the guy. So yeah. Sebastian, tell us what you do. Uh, tell us what you do over at JetBrains. Uh, yeah. So um, as luck would have it, I'm a developer advocate for Kotlin. Actually, for the Kotlin language itself. So we have we employ a team of about 90, 100 people who develop the language. Um, and wow. I have the yeah, it's it's a big team, um, and yeah, I have the pleasure of being one of three, four people who um, <laughs> I don't know how big my team is. Depends on how you count them. Uh, to to kind of bring bring the uh, the the new things that we build inside the language uh, to the public, and that is in the form of tutorials. That is in the form of talks. Uh, and that is in the form of like these these kind of like live streams as well. Very cool. Very nice. So, how long have you? Uh, I mean, I don't really know much about the history of Kotlin. I just remember that one day a buddy of mine who does a lot of Java work said, "Oh yeah, you should check it out." And it suddenly became common parlance, and I started hearing about it all the time. So, like, how long has it been around? Um, so Kotlin 1.0 was released in 2016, I believe. So that's okay. what, five years ago, uh, something like that. And yeah, it's it's been kind of like it it's had its its growth periods, but what when it really started like lifting off like crazy was when on Google I/O in I think 2018. Uh, someone will correct me on that. Uh, Google said, "Well, we're we're now supporting uh, Kotlin for Android development," nice. um, which was which was already great. And then a year later, they said, "Okay, uh, Kotlin is going to be the go-to language for Android." Um, and then things just exploded because at that point, it literally meant like if you if they provide new APIs, they guarantee that it'll be documented and that there will be examples. In Kotlin, but not in any other languages. Like there might still be Java examples, for example, but there's no guarantee for it. Uh, and at that point, yeah, uh, everything just kind of exploded and skyrocketed. Funnily so, enough, uh, that 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 was not interesting for me at all because I'm not an Android developer. <laughs> <laughs> for, for people that haven't done uh, Kotlin or they don't know Kotlin, how would you describe Kotlin? Is it like a superset of Java? Is it the derivative of Java? It's it's like if C sharp and the JVM had a baby, I guess. Right. Maybe. <laughs> so it's, it's the good things of um, Java with the good things of C sharp, and you're yeah, able so, to yeah. So, yeah. So Kotlin kind of has this. Uh, Kotlin isn't a afraid to say like, okay, some wheels don't need reinventing. It's okay to take good parts from other languages. So you'll see, um, th like, if you've ever written Swift, you'll see some constructs that are very similar. Uh, if you've written TypeScript, you'll see things that are very similar. Um, and yeah, but but the the underlying or the why did we create Kotlin in the first place? Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't create it so that Android developers would have a nicer language to write. That was actually just a nice side effect. The reason why we initially created this is uh, because we at JetBrains uh, happened to create these these wonderful tools like the the, the one that I'm running right here, like IntelliJ. Mm -hmm. And these are all built in Java. Like they're they're all JVM uh, development environments. And we've been developing this thing for twenty years. We we turned twenty now. I think if I go to like wow. this about page, yeah, you can even see our little like celebratory icon um, showing like that we're at twenty twenty years now. 
And uh, yeah, we quickly realized that there are some limitations in uh, in the Java programming language that hampered our own productivity. And since we already had a lot of knowledge about, well, everything from abstract syntax trees to compilers, just because, you know, it, it's our bread and butter interacting with these tools, uh, we figured, uh, yeah, maybe maybe we can do this better. And uh, as, uh, yeah, again, I'm a bit biased, but I, I think we did a pretty good job. I think we, <laughs> we kind of managed to fix some of the problems we had in other languages, um, just kind of give a very nice all-round experience. Nice. Very cool. So if I'm coming from something like a .NET or a Java or any sort of sort of statically typed language, I imagine this will be relatively familiar. Absolutely. So so Kotlin, just like any other languages, is, is just a statically typed language as well. Um, if if you have like if if you write something, uh, you'll see that I didn't actually type this this type out. So we have type inference like uh, many other languages as well. Um, but we are still statically typed um, un under the hood, which ah. is kind of useful because once again it allows your IDE to kind of reason about um, your. Uh, your program and it allows you to make much more sensible suggestions as well uh, so like all these things question from levinson 2504 is kotlin aimed towards beginners who are learning android dev uh so if you are develop if you're just starting to learn android i think google now recommends you start with kotlin as well and we wow. at jetbrains actually also think that uh kotlin is a great language uh to learn as, as a first programming language. I can actually, if, if, if I, I can pitch something here, uh, my my colleague Svetlana has written a book together with Bruce Echo uh, called Atomic Kotlin, mm -hmm. which starts you off uh, from like from zero. So if you have never programmed before, uh, Atomic Kotlin is gonna teach you from the is ground this, up. Uh, is this free? Um, I think the first three or four chapters are free. Um, okay. And uh, after that, you should have I think enough of a basic understanding to kind of maybe explore on your own or you can buy the rest of the book um yeah yeah so the the url is atomic cotton right i will will yes. uh, add the url in the video on youtube so when you watch it offline in fact i'm just going to add mm -hmm. it on the uh, tweet stream now so sounds there. sounds good is, i think the cotton... thing go on, oh no dude. go ahead no no no, no. go ahead there that's a good question, question from uh, Bahit. is kotlin for android development mostly or is it for other solutions as well <laughs> that really depends on who you ask um <laughs> so yeah as i mean i mean there's there's a certain search engine company which i think is is very very keen on on having yeah kotlin be well the mobile language right um but for for us we're really interested in seeing seeing kotlin everywhere hmm. so we are currently pushing really strongly towards people using Kotlin on server side, um, on mo sure on mobile, but also on on for desktop development, for example. I know that's kind of a dying breed. We hope to revitalize that, but uh, yeah. So even if you're if you're building like native apps uh, for macOS, Windows, you can do that with with Kotlin quite nicely as well. Very nice. And there's there's actually a bunch of other interesting section uh, like sectors that we're trying to to conquer. Uh, one of the big <laughs> ones currently is is, is data science. Um, currently, the, I think the strongest contender there is Python, uh, because there's well a lot of machine learning libraries. Um, there's just a, a huge ecosystem, but we have uh, a bunch of actually really interesting libraries for for this kind of stuff as well. Um, we have let me. Just pull something up here, Kotlin. We have Kotlin DL, which stands for Kotlin Deep Learning, um, which kind of gives you this whole framework of, um, yeah, doing doing deep learning. Uh, we have Multi K, I believe it's called Multi K, which allows you to do a lot of the things that Python developers like to do, which is these like. Uh, multi-dimensional arrays, vectors, like all this kind of stuff. Where we're really like we're trying to bring as much functionality into into Kotlin as possible, so that people can just be productive in in whatever they're doing. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. So I think that one of the things that uh, one of the things I've always noticed is 
there are like there are plenty of things you can, oh you know the syntax is that uh, you know the syntax is familiar because it's it's like this other language or mm -hmm. uh you know the the way that you use it is similar to this other language but the thing that oh, i always seem to get hung up on especially when i'm trying to learn something new is yeah. what are the opinions of the people who built it like how do they expect me to use it because sure like you can always hack something together and make it work mm -hmm. but yeah. What are the like you know semantically like what what are the kind of the idioms that we that that the designers are expecting us to use and and like when we start building stuff versus just how do we hack it together to make it work? That's a that's a big question right there. Um, <laughs> I, I I think I think the short answer to this is uh, listen to your IDE. Um, if you do something dumb, uh, it'll probably tell you. Uh, that's that's once again the great thing that if you are uh, if you're both the tool vendor and you're the you're the programming language vendor, you you get uh, really good good IDE support. Um, let me let me think about if I can conjure up an example. The problem with trying to figure out bad bad code is is always kind of difficult. Uh, let's let's see. Um, so we can write some kind of condition. Oh, you can already see like okay, if if you're writing a bunch of code. Um, so in this case, I, I hope this is kind of clear. Just sees uh, if the number one is not in uh, the list of one, two, three, uh, then it's going to tell you like, oh, this this if has an empty body, right? Like oh, these kind of these kind of little hints um, you'll you'll see in in a bunch of situations. Uh, let me let me try to conjure up something else here, maybe. So let's let's say that we have a get random number, uh, just like a, a function, and that returns four. Um, we'll, re we'll adjust the return type appropriately. So oh, four is definitely a random number. I like it. Yes. Uh, <laughs> chosen by throw of dice. I'm stealing that from a certain a certain web comic. Um, now we can we can write something like okay, we have val my number equals get random number, and then we say like okay, if my number is one, then one. Else, if my number is two, print two. Can we go all the way to ten? Uh, <laughs> sure, you know it's uh, no, no. keep it keep it nice and inconsistent, uh, <laughs> something like this. I don't know, and and you can <laughs> you can kind of see uh, that again. I get like these little wobbles here, and it's mm -hmm. gonna tell me like this cascade if should be replaced with when. I'm like, okay, what the heck is a when? Well, if I if I click on this, it gives me this nice little yellow bubble. It tells me, well, how about you replace the if with the when? Well, we click this thing, oh, and nice. all of a sudden, it it kind of shows us like how this code could look next. And this actually triggers the next little wobble. It says like, oh, this variable declaration could actually be inlined. You're like, hmm. Well, I guess we'll inline the variable. And like th these kind of like small iterations is how you end up uh, with code that's a lot more. Uh, kind of cotton like and yeah. yeah generally I just like pressing like alt enter on things and seeing if you can do something uh, so because that shows me my context action so here oh yeah I can remove the braces well I guess we can just do that here um, I guess that's already a bit nicer again uh, yeah I mean I yeah. learned a ton I learned a ton about dot net from resharper in Visual Studio <laughs> yeah <laughs> giving uh, me all sorts honestly, of optimizations it's, yeah it's it's kind of it's the same thing here so um, very very similar. And if you're coming from if you're coming from Java, which is kind of a special case, um, I don't know. Let's, I'm I'm not a Java developer, so I'll apologize for what's about to happen. Um, <laughs> just just to uh, clarify as well, right? You can have yes. intermixed uh, Kotlin and Java. Is that right? In your, yeah, in your not project? not ju not just that, but um, also if we have a some kind of Java class, and then we have like getter and setters for. Uh, this thing uh, what you can actually do is mm -hmm. um, so let's say you are a Java developer and you actually know what you're doing yeah uh, you can you can always go to tools <laughs> Kotlin and then is it tools Kotlin actually we can just press shift shift and then we say convert uh, and that gives us a bunch of different options including convert Java file to Kotlin file and we have this really oh, nice. clever app what? yeah which, which yeah that's just gonna look at uh, the code uh, that we have uh, yeah, okay. Maybe there's some other code that needs correcting. It's like, oh, okay, this is the this is the Kotlin version of of the same class. So I guess we can now call it Kotlin car, uh, and that's about it. 
<laughs> like so you so you had a you had a getter and a setter and yeah what happened what happened to them you don't need them now this is a public property and i can go change it exactly so so since this is since this is a var property um mm -hmm. you can you can change it uh just directly so let me actually implement uh let me let's just get rid of this and let's get rid of the syntax error i just introduced so val my car equals kotlin car uh we implement that and then if we do my car you can see that this is just um yeah it's a property on the thing that we can set it's all good um in fact i think we can also so one here's one one funny thing um i always forget the syntax for this we can also overwrite the getter with some kind of other um function i think we could just do that for example uh but then yeah it probably needs to be val so <laughs> in theory if you want to you can also have um you can still overwrite the getters and setters it just looks a little bit different so um, what's interesting between a val and a var is a val like yeah. a const that can't be changed Exa exactly so val the l is comes from final i guess so it, it exactly it can't be changed ah, okay. um so that's a read only one whereas a, a var you can you can reassign like those are so those then are the big... so then so when so i've i've built my app with with kotlin what do mm -hmm. i need to run it like do i need like a like a jre to run it does it all is it all sort of like it is it java compatible in the sense of like it it compiles down to java or does it come like what does it compile down to like how do we so eventually it, it... get Code. Mm -hmm. So it, it compiles. Uh, so let's not talk about Android in this context because that's a whole different ball game. Like Android sure. has its own compiler infrastructure. Generally, looking at Kotlin, um, the Kotlin compiler emits JVM bytecode. So to any kind of Java runtime environment, it's gonna look the same as if you had written it in Java. Nice. Okay. Um, the way that we usually get things to run is with uh with gradle that's kind of the, the the build system which which has been established um of course usually you don't write this kind of stuff yourself you just go to like file new project uh then you select like kotlin and you say like oh i want a console application wow. um right. and you select like your project jdk and and that's mm. about it but yeah so if you're if you're in the ide you can you can always just press like the little green green button uh the, the play button that's gonna run your application is not going to do much in this case and you can only and press the, the run button if you're in the main right so you need an entry point for your kotlin app yeah exactly yeah okay. so by default that's this is like your your entry point yeah. um and alternatively if you have the well if you have the application plugin installed and you have a, a main method set up which some frameworks they do that for you you can also just go to the terminal and you can mm -hmm. just say like gradle run mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So, but the, uh, the Gradle build system is actually quite powerful. I I would have to say, um, it's it's uh, it's quite complicated for for newcomers, I think. But it's uh, okay. it really it really pays off. Uh, kind of. So there's, there's a steep there's a steep learning curve to get started and set up, and then you're once you're there. It's... Yeah, but honestly, you can, you can get kind of far without touching, um, Great. without touching the Gradle file. And actually, okay. if, you, if, if you notice this, my Gradle file actually ends in .kts, uh, which is called, so that's Kotlin script, which means I can even, I'm, I'm writing uh, Kotlin code uh, in this configuration file to configure my build, which is kind of nice. Oh, that is like, nice. Imagine MS build with support for C Sharp. Uh, I think you're looking for Nuke build, right? <laughs> I think. Uh, that's built by my colleague Matthias, also from JetBrains, and that one also provides a C Sharp DSL for for C Sharp projects. What? So essentially, it's, I mean, I, I'm gonna <laughs> probably sound I'm probably gonna sound silly saying this, but I mean, it's essentially like a preprocessor. It's like SAS or less on CSS files, right? Kind of. So the w the way that I think it's a bit maybe it's it's a bit too deep to go into into Gradle right now. But essentially, your you kind of describe your build in in the context of a, a Kotlin domain specific language, which is just a fancy way of saying we have these cool calling conventions so that you can put uh, blocks behind uh, mm -hmm. behind variables and make it look kind of nice. 
And that's going to evaluate. It's going to figure out how to build your project, and then it's just going to run it. Very nice. So, yeah, it's it's a, a type of preprocessor. Oh, that's cool. So, so if I'm coming from a world where, yeah, like, I go to my IDE or I go to a CLI and I do, like, you know, .NET new console, for example. I just want to build a console app. Nothing, nothing crazy, nothing exciting. Just a console mm -hmm. app that goes and, you know, makes some HTTP calls or... Um, you know, maybe pulls in a few libraries or something to say, call an API or call a protected API or whatever. Yeah. So, so, what? so generally, uh, the, I, I assume that the, sorry, I kind of cut you off there. Please no, 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 finish okay. the question. No, 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 no. <laughs> like I'm, I'm, I'm thinking like, if I'm going to like, well, as soon as we're done, if I go and I've got IntelliJ installed and I'm going to do some work this afternoon on, you know, making, making API calls, for example, to a, uh, to an API, Mm -hmm. Which seems like a fairly straightforward task. Yeah. What's it going to take? That's what does true. it take for me to do that? So, um, so you just want to do client stuff? Or you also want to do like we can, you want to do like server stuff? Yeah. We, well, let me, uh, let me, eventually, we'll do uh, server stuff for sure. Yeah. Okay. So let me let me just pop open a, a, a project that I that I have where some of this stuff is configured so that I don't have to, like pick it out so so the, the the way that again i'm kind of biased there's a bunch of of different uh projects which allow you to do this kind of stuff um one of or two of two of the most most interesting ones i think in the space right now are ktor um that one we build ourselves um ktor is kind of a a split set of server and client components meaning that you can kind of you can you can as you can see you can build like a, a short little server which just says okay on on the slash route respond with some text but also unfortunately not on the front page it also comes with a bunch of clients where you can just say okay uh let's do a client dot get and um give give us a response and the well another alternative from from some other folks uh is http4k has a little bit of a different API, but at the end of the day, it's it's kind of similar. It once again, it allows you to do HTTP stuff from the server side, or it allows you to do it from the client side. Okay. Uh, and hmm. and for to 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 get going with these kind of things, hopefully there's usually, let's see. Uh, so Ktor Ktor has a, a start Ktor thing where you can just kind of click it together. If you've done Spring before, that might look kind of familiar. Hmm. Um. So, so there, yeah. we have we have a couple of questions from the audience. Chamber Let's Games go. is asking, does Kotlin have support for something like promises, tasks, and futures? Uh, uh -huh. Like async await kind of a syntax to allow you to be more um, relevant to current times, I guess. Mm -hmm. Okay, great question, honestly. Um, so Kotlin has, has its own concept for uh, concurrency and that's called coroutines mm -hmm. uh, let me try to might kind of build maybe an an isolated example for this for a second here uh, so so what we have let's let's assume that we have a function uh do something expensive mm -hmm um and that that calculates something so usually what what would happen in an in an io bound world is that you have some kind of delay um that that comes from somewhere i don't know takes a second or so and then you return expensive i don't know okay so this right now if if we just assume this quite um is your implementation that we we would say like okay if we do this, our program is gonna take one one second to complete. Like th this is gonna take one second. Uh, and if we do this twice in a row, um, it's gonna take two seconds. But uh, we essentially have this concept of coroutines, which again you'll probably be able to notice. I hope that it's imported. Yep. Uh, and we have, for example, this this async builder. Um, where if we do this, you can you can quite quickly see. Uh, oops, you can see that this creates a deferred, which is just a fancy word for a future. And then if we uh, 
to, to do this, actually, we need to tell our compiler, hey, this function might be doing something that's long running. So we mark it as, as suspend. Again, this is kind of, if, if you've done a sync await, I think you can kind of tell some, some parallels here. Yep. You get yep. you get this kind of you get this nice little information that hey what you're doing here might be suspending some kind of thread for a while. You know, and I then love if, that the ID is actually telling you that. It's, yeah, it's, a great point it's it's lovely. Uh, another one of my favorite features in in this regard um, is that if you do something that's recursive, it also gives you like a little little twisty icon uh, <laughs> to tell you that you're you're doing recursive calls. Nice. Um, which is is lovely and helps you <laughs> sometimes if you well we, we we said it before naming is hard sometimes so mm -hmm. if, sometimes if you if you accidentally call yourself uh that that can kind of save your life every once in a while and then of course if you have this function uh and you actually you you allow the context uh then you can you can do like an await here and a dot await um and yeah, which means that these two things will now be executed in parallel, um, and the whole thing will uh, will return after one second. I mean, we can actually try that, try compiling that. So, what's the significance of global scope here? Mm -hmm. So, this is a, a quick simplification. Generally, um, coroutines have this concept of structured concurrency meaning that you can spawn new new scopes yourself um which kind of control the lifetime of uh of how long your asynchronous applications run this is it's it's kind of strange to think about this in, in an abstract way so let's let's take a concrete example um you have a an application that has a, a, a page in it um or like a view let's call it and that view does a bunch of like network calls in the background and they take forever and your user gets frustrated uh, and it close and closes the page again now right. in in usually i don't know if you have like go routines or or if you have some kind of other async await you might be leaking those those asynchronous tasks they might still try to complete they might still to download those long running tasks with coroutine scopes uh, you can kind of take all the um, all the the coroutines that that belong to a certain view, for example, and when you when you destroy the view, you just say, okay, this scope now gets cancelled, and all the tasks that you've spawned and all the children of those tasks and the children of those tasks, they'll automatically get cancelled. They'll automatically get cleaned up. Ah, so okay. that's that's kind of the the whole idea of this this scoping. Oh, that's cool. Nice. And there's actually also another fun thing. Um, these builders, they also accept, um, we can see it up here, a context, um, which could be, for example, dispatches.io, uh, if we import this one. And now you can now you can even specify where, like on, on which uh, kind of thread pool your application should run. So if you're saying, okay, I need to make sure that my stuff happens on the, I, uh, on the UI thread, and maybe nice. you want to run it on main. But if you're doing a lot of I.O., maybe you want to run it on I.O. Like, all these kind of, like, little things um, allow you... Like, co coroutines is unfortunately not a topic where, like, a 10-minute introduction is going to be very mm. easy, I think. <laughs> uh, but yeah. but it's, a, it's a super powerful mechanism. Yeah. Well, I think, I think like, in, in, in our, and at least in the .NET world, you know there were there were some some pretty big pushes over the last few years that you know, there's a a vast majority of APIs now are asynchronous or they have asynchronous options. Yeah. And uh, you know there I, I seem to remember at one point and uh, I can't remember which platform it was but there was a certain part where they said you know if it's longer than like a like a forty millisecond call or something you're going to end up with a uh, with an async alternative and so mm -hmm. there are really kind of two parts to that and one is okay well how do I use them right and then how do I yeah. know how they're going to execute? Uh, you know, like yeah. we use something like a, like you have an async function, a suspend function, and then you await that functions. And then, and instead of having to write callbacks and do all that drama, you'd kind of get this serial execution the way you would expect it, mm -hmm. uh, provided that you were doing, provided that you're doing that that awaiting um, to say, hey, you know, essentially wait on the return of this of this task or wait on the return of this, and. Mm -hmm. 
the problem is it gets people in trouble if they don't fully sort of if there's not like a good understanding of what's going to execute when um yep. this sounds like it's this sounds like the your expectations as a developer should be quite similar yeah so um it's i mean there's there's no talking away the fact that the moment you add concurrency to your project you add complexity like that's that's a fact but with coroutines you kind of get given some mechanisms which make it a bit easier to to reason about this kind of stuff for example something that i haven't shown off yet is um if we if we have uh, another function i don't know do something else and that's also a suspend function and i don't know what that does i don't really care from the context of another suspend function i can always just call that um sorry no, see let's not do the recursive call <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's do the proper call like i can call that and if i want to like i can i can call that like sorry um i I, repeat. I i can also call that like three times if i want to inside of like my suspending functions themselves i usually write code that looks sequential and that is like yeah. uh, it's it's quite powerful because these things they don't need extra annotations i do not need to think about uh yeah like a sync await it's it's kind of comfortable especially together with uh with the ide support that we get so then essentially if i'm if i am awaiting within my synchronous code like if i'm awaiting inside of my main thread essentially mm -hmm. any so other not, yeah so any other ahead. down any other downstream uh, you know, suspendable functions or any other sort of downstream um, uh, downstream work that's going to happen that's asynchronous. It's all sort of, all of that and the like. These three do something else calls are all three of those now going to be? Are they going to be executed in parallel? As in the task has been queued and it's gone to execute, or are they going to out? They are they going to run like one after the other by virtue of the fact uh that it's a it's an asynchronous method inside of another asynchronous method. Yeah. So, so in this case, um, they would run one after the other. But if you want to kick them off um, simultaneously, uh, we can make this an extension function. Give me just one second here. Um, we can we can launch these in parallel, and this is pretty much like fire and forget. Okay. Um, okay. And yeah, they'll just they'll just get started. Okay. Cool. Uh, so so now these three would run in parallel. Wondering why this is complaining right now. Oh, because I'm. Because <laughs> no, that's okay. Suspend now. Anyway, yeah. Because that's that's one of the things that like that is that is somewhat of a difference, and it's like something that we would have to look out for as we sort of venture out into Kotlin, and. Mm -hmm. You know, typically, what like I would have to await that call, for example, like that do something else. Yeah. I'd have to do an await on that. So, and I think uh, Chamber Games, Chambers Games says this says what I'm trying to say in very few actually correct words, which is that suspend functions are implicitly awaiting the other suspend functions. That's what it seems like. Uh, yeah, pretty much. Okay. Exactly. Okay, that's super cool. Cool. Uh, like it's it's the 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 nice thing is is that yeah. Essentially, you can you can take uh, sequential code that was blocking beforehand, and you can make the parts that are um, that that would usually be blocking you where you're waiting. For example, you can you can wrap those in in kind of these coroutine calls, and you get a, a really nice uh, API out of it, which has has high performance but still kind of reads quite quite easily. I think. Okay. Okay. So, this is, you mentioned that this was, uh, is this a KTOR app? This one that you have open right now? Or is this just a, yeah, this so, is just yeah. console? Oh, okay. Yeah, so, so this like, is a KTOR app. So, mm -hmm. so like in the, the .NET world, and ASP.NET, we have ASP.NET. I mean, I'm sure somebody out there has written like an alternate HTTP framework for uh, .NET. I, I, have, <laughs> I, have, I have no idea what it is. There, there, are, um, there are plenty out there. But... I would say, I can't, and I don't know any sort of specific inside baseball or numbers, but my suspicion would be the vast majority of folks who are writing a .NET web app are using ASP.NET to do it. 
right? Mm-hmm. So, KTOR is produced by by JetBrains too. Yeah. Uh, the HTTP for K, you said that was a community project. I mean, yep. Of the, you know, of the of the the sort of frameworks that are out there, the frameworks that are available for building web apps. Is there like a clear, is there a clear big one right now? Like the one that people would use because it's either particularly easy, it's easy to get started with, it's super powerful, you know, sort of whatever. Mm -hmm. So the answer to that is, is, is spring. It's, it's spring. That's, I mean, that's a, from a, from a historical reason, it it makes a lot of sense because, uh, yeah, with Kotlin, we strive to have a hundred percent Java interoperability. So the biggest Java thing kind of naturally became the biggest Kotlin thing as well. And the folks at Spring are also doing a lot of work to support Kotlin specific constructs and make it really nice and easy to use from from Kotlin as well. So yeah, that's okay. that's kind of the big one. I think we actually did a um, we have a YouTube series on youtube.com slash Kotlin um, which targets specifically uh, I think we call it springtime in Kotlin. And yeah, exactly. From <laughs> from my colleague Anton, uh, you can you can check this out. Um, it kind of talks through how how you can write Spring app with with Kotlin as well, which I think is is quite nice. Nice. But so no but spring. of course, it is it is kind of still this this heavy beast in 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 a certain way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's what we've heard, and I, and I've heard there. I guess I don't know if it's is it. Has it always been modularized, or is it getting more modul- modularized, where you don't necessarily need the full the full spring, and you can grab the pieces that you need? Um, I mean that it's it is it is pretty modular, but com- comparing it to uh, yeah, comparing it to Kato, for example, it's just uh, it it relies heavily on on some constructs that are typical in Java. For example, annotations, okay. right? The the little things with the with the at sign mm-hmm. that you put everywhere. Yeah. If I oh, scroll yeah. through this example app, you can see there's not a single at sign anywhere, mm-hmm. um, because instead, what what we make use of is is these so-called Kotlin DSLs again. So we we have these these fancy functions. Um, like if if you just look at this, um, I think it's very reminiscent of some other like micro frameworks, in I don't know like Python maybe Flask or like Sinatra and Ruby. But yeah. what really happens here is is that these fu- like all of these they're just regular functions. Um, they they just happen to have this this fancy convention where if the last parameter of your function is a is another function, so is is a code block, then instead of let me see if I can actually refactor this, um, instead of writing it like this, which I guess checks out. Um, so instead of just passing it as as a function parameter, you get to move it outside, which makes it look like, hey, we've we've we have a, a function here that's kind of in the in the language. Ah, interesting. Okay, that's cool. So then, if I'm using Spring, do I still end up in a world where I have to do all those sort of annotations, and or are there are there you know these shims that are going to help me? use them and not litter my code with annotations, for example, or any other of these mm-hmm. other, you know, any of these other sort of Java S conventions, like are any of those sort of hidden? And it, I'm assuming that takes developer work to do that. Somebody's got to do it, right? Yeah. So generally, there generally, you would still use the same annotations. And I think that also okay. makes a lot of sense. Um, just from the perspective of, well, if you have a mixed code base, you don't want to just be one one half be well the well documented Java Spring code and the other one be the Wild West Kotlin code using some kind of crazy, <laughs> uh, yeah, some kind of crazy constructs that no one has ever heard of before. Yeah, no, that makes sense. So then, um, like, obviously, like we encounter Spring security relatively frequently. Uh, so, sorry, very very quick question. Did you just lose my uh, my video feed? We did. We just lost your screen. Yeah. I don't know what happened. Oh no! Yeah. So <laughs> I, I can I can tell you what happened. I have this I have this wonderful tool, which closes tabs for me when I'm haven't touched them for twenty minutes. Uh, because I'm I'm the type of person who has way too many tabs open usually. So let That's me just awesome. lock that and and rejoin. 
Yeah, it's it's awesome when it works, but sometimes it, it becomes a little bit over eager. I I think that should do it again. Okay, yeah, we're back. We see your we see your screen again now. <laughs> Great. So I know that uh like, sorry. No, no, it's all good. So we encounter a lot of spring security, obviously, for things like authentication authorization. And mm -hmm. we've seen that that exists in sort of uh, in, in the KTOR world, that there is at least something there um, mm -hmm. to, to sort of support, you know, getting people signed in and, and sort of handling mm -hmm. that sort of thing. But when it comes to, you know, when it comes to sort of like application security and the like, I mean, how much of that is sort of if I'm if I'm new to Kotlin and I'm say I'm coming in from Java for example how much of that is uh, how much of that's going to be like is that going to be familiar to me like the way that I secure a Java app for example the way that I harden certain things or the way that I uh, you know like handle my handle building secure software like mm -hmm. I assume because this ultimately ends up as Java bytecode that most of the work that I'm going to do in Java I'm also going to do here to do this to sort of achieve the same thing right um from the perspective of a user now or in the in the sense of like hardening your binary somehow well i mean more like the patterns and the practices and the things like that that i would go through uh, mm. to to you know to to look for certain things in my code or to mm. you know like if i'm coming from if i'm coming from java which where i would be familiar right mm -hmm. yeah so this is kind of um Again, it it really depends on your use case, right? Uh, if you're if you're someone who who's building like a small web service or something, uh, you might find that hey, we can just whip up a, a quick HTTP endpoint with Ktor that works really well. That that goes fast and that starts up about I don't know ten times faster than a than a Spring application. <laughs> but if you are relying on like okay, I want to build something um, with a large team. Uh, that has certain requirements and we want to use as much as possible like out of the box uh, you're probably gonna have a, a better life with spring like very very clearly i have to admit i'm not a, a spring developer myself like i i mostly fiddle around with uh, with kator uh, as a as a developer advocate i'm like a professional hello world star right so, uh, <laughs> so they're, they're always they're always small applications sure there's yeah usually nothing nothing too big um but yeah, so so Kotlin, uh, Kotlin is a language. I mean, completely doesn't care what framework you use. Uh, the developers of the framework might get like their feelings hurt if you don't <laughs> use whichever one. But sure, Ktor Ktor is a lot more like bring bring your own beer, bring your own pizza, bring your own features. Like yeah. you're gonna have you're gonna have an easier if if you're just saying okay, I need. A specific like I I want the canonical way on how to integrate my MongoDB with my application. You're probably gonna have an easier time with Spring because it's like an explored space. They probably just have the like the plugin or the the connector ready. Whereas with with Ktor, it's gonna be like okay, like here's your endpoints, here's the <laughs> the, the set of features we have. Uh, you can, you can bring everything else. Like yeah. you can use a standalone library. Whatever. Yeah, yeah. No, that makes sense. That's cool. So it's sort of like, uh, I don't want to, I, I really absolutely hate the term batteries included. Um, mm -hmm. It's more of a uh, batteries available, right? I mean, because you have the yeah. entirety of the Java ecosystem available to you. Um, it's just a matter of, of using what you need when you need it. And I would imagine, yeah. and maybe I'm wrong here, but is there a... When I'm using, if say I I'm using a Java library, um, mm -hmm. it's like I, maybe I'm almost kind of thinking of like a, maybe something kind of like a TypeScript, right? Where you end up in a place of like, well, I've got TypeScript, and so I, a developer's gone and written TypeScript to like typings and bindings, right? So that when I'm mm -hmm. building a TypeScript app, they've written a root JavaScript library that's actually doing all the work, but they've got these bindings that make it sort of TypeScript aware so that I can, I can get the advantage of IntelliSense and all the other things, you know, you know auto completion, mm -hmm. whatever. So if I'm building a Java library, can I build like a, like a Kotlin interface or some sort of interop, like, like assembly in between the two so that I can, I can have a more sort of Kotlin friendly or Kotlin esque way to interact with it or. Okay. 
so so let me let me actually try to show you this again in in, in the sample of we'll we'll do another Java car because we we haven't had enough of those yet. So uh, <laughs> we'll we'll have some we'll have some seats um, and we'll have uh, I don't know a string make uh, and then we construct a constructor. And so then... there's a there's a question. Does uh, does Kotlin compile to native? Uh, to native what? To native JVM bytecode? Absolutely. <laughs> to... <laughs> um, I, wonder, I wonder if it's for mobile, I guess. Uh, yeah. So we actually have uh, something called Kotlin native, um, mm -hmm. which is which is another target. So we generally, th th this is going to be a, a, a bit of a tangent here, right. but Kotlin supports this notion of multi-platform programming. Hmm. And you can see here that we have three targets right now for Kotlin. We have Kotlin JVM, which is usually what most people are looking at when they first do Kotlin, uh, because that's just kind of where the ecosystem sets, where you can use JVM code and you can uh, and you emit JVM code. Then there's mm -hmm. Kotlin native, um, which literally just emits native binaries for whatever system you're running on. And with a little bit of work, you can also use native uh, libraries, like, I don't know, libcurl or libffi or, or whatever, directly from, from your Kotlin native code. And then there's Kotlin JS, which I do a lot with, uh, which allows you to write libraries and and web applications uh, using Kotlin as well. Mm -hmm. And of course, nice. they all kind of have have their own like little um, specialties. Let's sure. or yeah, like obviously there are some things you can do in in JavaScript code. Like I don't know, you can define an object to just be like eh, dynamic. The platform probably knows what it is at runtime. That's something you can't do in native code. Like that's just going to explode. Um, yeah, but the answer is you can compile to native code if you want to. There's also Graal VM, which is this uh, currently very popular project of compiling uh, just general JVM code to uh, to native code, which right. I believe works in most cases with Kotlin as well. Oh, that's cool. So sort of like, I guess sort of like a .NET native for us, right, Christos? Yes, exactly. Yeah, compiling down to a specific machine code. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, so we have that. Um, that's probably especially relevant if you are looking at, I don't know, if you're doing like serverless and you're really scared about startup time, like mm -hmm. 250 milliseconds of, of JVM startup like makes you go like, ah, yeah. then yeah. Um, sure. But, but generally... Um, like the, don't underestimate the performance of a JVM if you can afford the little bit of overhead in in memory. Like yeah. speed wise, you're you're still gonna get quite quite good results here. Um, so yeah, let me let me just uh, quickly finish. This example, we have a couple getters and setters, and I don't know. We also have a public void change make um, string other make and we just say this make equals other make okay so we just have like a, a java class which doesn't really do much besides like sit there and mm -hmm. now if we once again we steal ourselves a new island file i'm just gonna try to keep as little code on the screen as possible uh, and we instantiate one of these java cars uh, mm -hmm. then first of all you can see that okay the invocation for the seats and for the uh, for the make, like that's just as you would have it in 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 Java, as, or if if it was a Kotlin object as well. Let sure. me actually make these private. Other, otherwise, I feel like it 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 does not it's not going to feel the same. So, note that we only have a get seat and set seats here, and get make and mm -hmm. set make, but these are private. So what you would not expect me to be able to do is to say j dot make equals foo. Right. Right. Yep. And if we click on this, or actually, if we can even even if we just hover over it, we can see that the Kotlin compiler intelligently resolves this to set make. Oh, that's interesting. So it automatically inserts uh, parts to your uh, like in your application code to make the interop between Java code and Kotlin code like completely transparent. Ah, okay, okay. Well, because that's that was kind of where I was heading. Is so so we've got a library, of course, for interacting with our systems called, uh, you know, um, uh, Imsal for J. That's our that's our mm -hmm. Microsoft authentication libraries, and 
I've never. I mean, if you want to, to, we can we can try we can try pulling this one in if you like. Sure. <laughs> we can see well, how it looks like. Sure. Let's actually that's a that's a great idea. Let's do that. So, uh, I I don't think there are any sort of MSAL, uh, uh I don't think there's like a, and and I think I, I almost feel like I'm not saying the right thing. So, if I want to build a package, like I want to build an assembly that I want mm -hmm. to consume, and I'm going to be, and I want to write it in Kotlin. Yeah. What am I it's actually so, producing? <laughs> uh, you're a jar file, like like okay. with every other Java application as well. Like it's the same publishing mechanisms. You're gonna publish it to the same repositories. Um, it's all the same. We we kind of we we're piggybacking really strongly on on the whole uh, Java ecosystem. Okay. Like okay. there's there's no no reinvention happening here. Okay. Right. So then, so, so our the, library. What's the library called? M S A L. 4J. 4J. Yep. That is our sort of primary... Okay. That's our primary authentication package. And we're not in a web app, so there are other ways that we can that we can try to use it. There's really one primary way that it gets used. Um, okay. Or one sort of primary thing. So yeah, so once you're... Once you get that pulled in, let's let's take a look. Sure. Okay, so uh, since I'm using the, the, the Kotlin Gradle. Gradle DSL, uh, it's going to yeah. look a little bit different. Compile, by the way, uh, in in Gradle is deprecated. Someone needs to make a pull request here. Um, Ooh, dun, so, dun, dun. Yeah, uh, let's let's copy this. Uh, it's m cell for j one nine one. So what's the, what's the right way to do it now? Uh, it's implementation. Oh, just implementation. Okay. Yes. Or generally, there's there are some slight nuances, but I have, uh, in all my time of working with Gradle, I have never felt those nuances. So it's probably, yeah, this <laughs> probably you're gonna be fine if you just replace it with implementation. <laughs> so, okay, and so is this a is this is this one that we're in? Is this the is this a web app or is this a uh, a console app? Console app probably be easiest, at least to what, just to see how we would whichever use it. one's easiest. Then let's let's treat it as a console app. Okay, let's do let's do let's do console then. Um, so in MSAL, we have this concept of a public client. We have a concept of a confidential client. Uh, all that really means is one of them has a secret and can keep a secret, and the other one can't. Usually, you would use a public client and say uh, a mobile app or in a, a single page app running in a browser. Usually, use confidential apps that are going to run on servers. Um, mm -hmm. So for us, we'll just do a confidential app, and then. Uh, let me get my I'm gonna get my msal for j pulled up here myself too. Uh, so there's gonna be relying very heavily on on your knowledge of this library because I have no idea what we're gonna be doing. Yep. <laughs> so um, let me get to so essentially we need to create this new confidential client first. I'm trying to find my okay. uh, trying to find my initialization stuff for instantiating a new client. Can I, can I just say confidential client? Yeah, uh, it is called a confidential client application. Yep, that's it. Mm -hmm. um, and they use this builder. There's sort of a builder, uh, a builder mechanism. So there's a dot builder that hangs off of that, uh, and that's going to expect a, a client ID, which I'll send you one here in a minute. Um, but it's okay. just it's just going to be a string. <laughs> um, and then there'll also be a credential that comes as part of that too, uh, which. There's actually something called a client credential factory create from secret. Um, is that what I want to do here? Uh, it is, but you could do it in a very you can do it in a variable, and we'll we'll reference it. it. Doesn't have to be in that line, but yeah, that's essentially what it'll be. Your credential will be it's a client credential factory create from secret, and then I'll give you a string secret to use too. Okay, so and, this is that is that is the same one as this one. Uh, no, there are two oh, of them. No, that's a different one. Okay, yeah. CID and then also uh, the cred. So the cred will be the second oh, okay. thing we sent, we pass into the builder. Oh, okay. Yep. And then we have. Um, uh, and, and... Okay. And then hanging off of that, we have a dot authority. So, we let's 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 make this a bit more readable. And then that'll be a string. We uh, that'll be a string. I give you two. Everything's everything's just a string. And then we just need to uh, then we just need to build it. So dot build mm. at the end. So this gives us our client that we can use to go and get tokens for talking to different services or whatever. So okay. uh, I'm going to go create. I'm going to go create you one of these right now. But the next thing, or actually, uh, yeah, I guess it's fine. I'll go create you one. So I'm going to go get you a 
give you a couple. Yeah, some, nothing. If you like some guids, uh, I've got I've got plenty of them. So I'm going to give you a bunch of 32, 32 character guids. So let me get you a new app here. And uh, let's see. So in the meantime, I'm just going to quickly create a file called credentials here. Okay. Uh, and we can actually... So the, the fun thing is that reading files in Kotlin is, is quite simple, fortunately. So we can <laughs> just do this and then we'll, we'll just get the lines out of it. Okay. Um, so these are, these are going to be my creds. And then you'll just you'll just let me know this the CID. Yep. First. And I so I just I just put that in the uh, I just put that in the chat so you'll have a client ID, and then I'm gonna send you a, I'm gonna send you a secret that I'm gonna delete immediately after right mm -hmm. as well. So okay, so there's your client ID. Here is the secret in its entirety. I hope that it copied correctly and that it doesn't get butchered by the uh, butchered by the uh, the chat. But that's yeah, cool. That's... We'll get that figured mm -hmm. out. Um, okay. So now you have the pieces that you need, and then for the authority, I will get you an authority. The authority is really just who's the token, uh, you know, who's the token group that, or who's the the token endpoint that's going to consider you, you know, that's going to be your. Uh, it's going to vouch for who you are. So here's the authority you can use. We may have to make a small change to that, but the only thing that's actually a secret is the is the the actual secret that we sent you. But that's fine. So now mm -hmm. we've got this client, and usually the way we do this client, and this will be a little bit different. So hanging off of that client application object, we'll have uh, an acquire token. Uh, I believe it's acquire token for app uh, on that after, confidential after build. No, no. Uh, well, so the build's going to give you an actual object. So the build will okay. set C to something, and then we've got then we... an, uh, an acquire token. Uh, oh, so these are a little, these are a little bit different. We don't necessarily need an acquire token sign. Let's see. So M cell for J. If if they're called get acquire token or something, then they'll automatically be renamed here. Let's see. So it may just be, they may all just be overrides of the, uh, <laughs> I wonder if they're all just going to be overrides of the, um, of the acquire token method. So let me take a quick look here. Da -da 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 -da. So we've got our stuff. We've got our stuff. We're going to build our app and then we are going to acquire token with some parameters. Let's see. Um, so under acquire token, so we, those are on behalf of parameters. We definitely don't want that one. We've got client client credential parameters. Those are the ones that we need. Mm -hmm. So we need to create uh, create an instance of those, I suppose. Via um, factory, or oh, like of, these. Of course, can we, there's can we a, do this directly? Of course, there's a factory. Oh. Um, <laughs> let's see. What's the best way for us? Because essentially the thing we have to build are what are called the scopes, which is just a list of the permissions that we need. Um, so yeah, so let's create a new client credential parameters object. Um, uh, via the builder, I assume? Um, yes, we're going we're gonna to do client, client credential parameters dot build. Yeah, there's our builder. Um, and then that's looking for a list of strings. So we only have one string. So whatever the best way to get an array of strings in there is, I can give you the string we're going to use. Sure. Um, so I'm, I'm interested that this, well, it actually takes a set, but we can we can just give a set directly. Sure, why not? Oh, okay, cool. So the, the scope that we're going to use is uh, user.read.all. And that's the, okay. that's the only scope that we need. Um, so then do a build on those, uh, on that, that builder object and um let's see if we get a token first can you just print the return of acquire token there should be i think there's an access token object that hangs off of that sure. so we we can uh sorry well let's let's see what does this return a completable future okay 
So what do we do with a completable future? That's actually a, 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 we probably await it, huh? That's what I would think. Yeah, I would. I would imagine we would have to await that. Or join? Does that yeah, yeah. join us I'm, back? I'm currently just. I'm currently just thinking if the. Give me give me one second here. Is it complete? Did it, did it kill my connection again? Oh no. no. No, I don't think so. Well, uh, I think so. Unless you're not moving no, anything. Okay, never mind. Okay, it, it was just closing Twitch chat. Sorry. Okay. I, I just saw a window vanish on my on my left screen. That kind of scared me. Um. So I think there should be. Okay. Let's let's actually see. <clears throat> I'm thinking if there's an adapter inside Kotlin coroutines where we can literally just tell it suspend until this function is is done. Ah, so okay. Let me see here. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Integration with JDK8 completable future. So while you're looking for that, um, mm -hmm. someone Chamber Games is asking: Is uh, is Kotlin uh, using its own kind of package manager behind the scenes, or is it all based on Maven? It's it's all that? based it's all based on Maven. Good. So I it's or right. well, it's 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 Gradle, which again resolves to Maven Central. Yeah. But yeah. yeah. Hey, look at that! We actually have. If we make this a suspend function, <laughs> look at that! We can just await the complete. <laughs> That's, That's awesome. So yeah, now now again we just we just write. Uh, I, I I don't know what what does it give to back an auth result. It's called an auth result. Um, so the that yeah, auth result okay. will have an access token and some other data hanging off of it. It yeah, looks like yeah. So, so yeah. Uh, it looks like so, there's actually a dot get that hangs off of that completable future. Um, that might very well be the case as well, but let's see what dot get does in theory. <laughs> uh, waits if necessary for this future to complete and then returns its result i mean i guess that also would work but now that we already have this nice example of uh of being able to await it why not await it it's, okay. <laughs> it's... yeah okay. I, I i feel that um it almost feels like uh the uh, like is it the dot result for uh, async await in dot net which is not particularly clean so it's better to await um, yeah, so the, the other one that we actually had here with get was actually a blocking method. So, yeah, yeah. I see. Um, I mean, yeah. oh, okay. I guess we can just do that. Yeah. Hey. So then, so then, if you run this, can you just print out the token and see if we get it? Yeah. The auth result. Uh, uh, there's, well, this do the access token that hangs off of that. Yep. Cool. Let's try. Fingers crossed. Also, fingers crossed that my machine will be able to <laughs> compile this while, <laughs> while streaming. Oh, look at that! Utilization is going up, 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 up. Mhm. Mm That's multi multi core compilation and everything. We got to get somebody. Um, so, so you're gonna have to you're gonna have to help us find somebody, Sebastian, who builds uh, who builds Android apps with Kotlin. Because um, okay. we've we've had a request, we've had multiple requests actually to uh, <laughs> to get a um, uh, to get what the uh, to get somebody to come on and build a, a Kotlin Android app for us, and so we gotta so we gotta find we gotta find the right person to do it. Uh, okay, mm -hmm. so there's something about our scope that it does not like. So let's see here. This would have been the scope, right? Yes, that is, is this a... that is the scope. So, let's see. So we have client credentials parameters, right? And then we've got our builder, and then we've got our scope. Oh, you know what? I gave you the wrong scope. That would be why. Just uh, do. Um, hmm. I know. Go read, right? uh, do uh, HTTPS colon slash slash graph uh, graph dot Microsoft dot com graph dot Microsoft dot com for oh, slash dot default. So default, yeah. So dot default like this? Yep. Yep. No. Let's run that. Dot, yeah. Yep. 
So the the do scope want, do you for. Want to explain to people. Do you want to explain to people why we always fall into that trap? Because I I mess it up sometimes as well when you're on confidential hey. clients. So we did get so we did get our uh, we did get our access token. In fact, if you if you take that if you take that token out, we can go over to JWT.ms and we can take a look at what's in it. We'll make sure that we got the right that we got the right token. But um, sure. the dot default scope is for it's, it's essentially for clients that don't have interactivity. And in this case, this isn't yep. an interactive client because it's a it's a client credential. So it's just essentially a console app or a daemon or something that's running somewhere. Um, dot default says. <laughs> Any permissions that you have that have been configured are the permissions that I need to get. So you don't really ask for a specific scope. You say, give me all of the permissions that have been requested or that have been configured for this specific resource. Yes. Um, so I had to and I had to add that users.read.all. And if you look down there in the roles, you'll see user.read.all in that list. I just, so. uh, I just put the, uh, the, the blog post that you wrote, the fantastic blog post that you wrote a couple of months ago about the default and when to use it. Yeah. So and then uh, it's it it goes back to the V1. So for the for the people who've used Azure AD in the past, it goes back to the V1 behavior for Azure AD, which is you couldn't say I need a token for just user dot read or you know for a very specific scope. Instead, your tokens were uh, for a specific resource, so the graph as a whole instead of uh, graph user dot read. So you had to configure: Do I need user dot read? Do I need mail dot read, etc. And then whatever that configuration was, we called it static consent. Whatever that configuration was, a user had to consent to up front. If you've got a piece of functionality somewhere deep in the bowels of your application that only 2% of your users are gonna use, you don't wanna ask for them for permission to do that until you actually need to, right? Because then you're gonna end up in a, in a weird place. But um, but yeah, so, so we get so we get our access token, which is great. We can take this access token and go make an HTTP call. So. If we want to take this access token and go just make like a really easy HTTP call, what kind of mm -hmm. like what kind of client do we have just to go make a call with this token in the header? Um, so in this project, I have a Kato HTTP client actually already pre-configured. I think. Let me just yoink that from over here. Is that the technical um, term? <laughs> that's the technical term. Is that a, is there it a go. verb? To yoink? <laughs> it is. It is. Um, yeah. So, again, this is just something that I, I pre-configured beforehand because it requires, like, four, four Gradle artifacts um, oh, that, that I didn't want to add. <laughs> okay. Um, but, yeah. Um, so, what, what this does is it gives us an HTTP client mm -hmm. based on an engine called CIO or Coroutines.io. We've, we've heard that word before oh, okay. today. So, it uses the same underlying technology. Uh, it has a bunch of nice features for serializing, deserializing um, JSON, and it sends right. a browser user agent. So, that, I don't know, to be covert. Awesome. <laughs> so, yeah. the, one, the one thing we need it to do is to also send an authorization header with the value of that token that we get when we when we run okay. it. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, let's try. <laughs> <laughs> All um, right, cool. So what what are, what are we doing? We're, we're getting or Yep, we'll do yeah. a get and we're going to do a get on um https colon whack whack graph.microsoft.com forward slash v1.0 uh forward slash users. That's fine. We does the users. does the URL string uh, come automatically, or did you have to type it? Like, does it know to uh, cast it to URL string, or did you? Have um, to so yeah, th these are these are our name hints that we mm -hmm. can get automatically. I'm not sure if we can we can disable them if we want to, but no, yeah. No, I don't want to disable. <laughs> I just find it very no. interesting that it does it for you, so you know what kind of types you're using there. Right? It's Rather it's than... the it's my my most loved feature in all of IntelliJ. We actually have this for pretty much all languages. Um, uh -huh. If you go under appearances and then, or sorry, editor, they're called inlay hints down here. And you can right. see we get we got them for like 10 languages. And then if you go to Kotlin, there's like four different uh, categories. I have all of them turned on. So uh, it's this, quite nice. Is this an ID only feature? Does it have to do anything with the compiler or anything else? Just a hint for no, you to but, know? No, but if you want to have this in kind of in your language as well, um, we also allow um, named arguments. So you can also write right. it like this. But then oh, nice. it's actual okay. text. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. um, yeah, okay, so I'm not sure what we're going to get back, so I guess we're just going to get a string. We'll get some and JSON now, back. 
Uh, well, I mean, what is Jason if not a spring, right? <laughs> um, and now let me try to quickly see if I can find some... Hey, there's a headers block. That seems kind of useful. Uh, let's, let's see what this headers builder allows me to do. Uh, I'm, I'm sure I can, can add like a... Can we add a new one? Uh, or uh it... yeah, I mean that's kind of the hope. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm 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 just looking for again uh configures header builders. Okay. Wait, can we we can probably make it even easier. Because we just need one header, right? Yeah, so just, just the one. Okay. Then Well, let's... I guess it depends on whether yeah. or not it'll automatically put extra ones like an accepts header and stuff like that, but well, that's uh, we'll, good point. we'll start with authorization. So this is going to be what authorization bearer or what? Yep, bearer space the token. And then, so we can do this fancy syntax, which is it's uh, string interpolation. But nice. if we use the nice. if we use these little parens, we can actually put complete, um, sweet, sweet. yeah, even even complex stuff in here. I can't okay. without string interpolation these days. I can't believe that we did it. Different way in the past. <laughs> right. Stringed up, stringed up so, format. Okay. So let's so. let's have a look at what comes back, I guess. Sure. Yeah. Let's let's take a look at it. We should and get back a then... list of users. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just so that we kind of get an idea of what we're working with. Dun, 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 dun. I know. We need I have the... high hopes. Okay, 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 there we go, look at that. So there's our OData. Okay. And there's our oh, nice. there's our array of users. So yeah, we get a val the value property has an array of users in it. Um, nice, so I, I think if, if we, I can probably open a new scratch file with JSON format, we can put that in here, press this button, and now we can kind of see at least what our result yep. is. So again, yep. a fancy feature in, in IntelliJ, scratch files allow you to just create like a throwaway file if you just want to put awesome. something in there. Yeah. Very nice. Um okay. And now we we get a, a bunch of uh, data, I guess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's just a bunch it's just all the users and it's the 78 different versions of myself that live in my directory, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You yourself and I. That's that is yeah. a very okay. I see. <laughs> yeah. So no, this is just so graph is our sort of main entry point to all the Microsoft APIs like your user directory, your uh, office subscriptions with stuff like your Office 365 mail and your calendar and all that sort of different stuff. Um, okay. But it's just sort of this, it's this always present, this always present API. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that nice. That we use for a lot of stuff just so that we don't have to go stand one up. So, yeah, I mean, we can get a token with specific set of scopes. We can use MSAL for J and we use it the way that you would expect to, like in normal, in in a normal mm -hmm. thing and and but we can still do it mm -hmm. in column and we can get data back so i mean it checks checks all the boxes we, yeah i mean if we still have some time we can uh, try parsing these into actual column objects yeah if you sure. try. there may so, even be a uh, uh, sorry no no go ahead um yeah, so so I have I have something called the Kotlin X serializer already pre-configured again just for simplicity's sake, but I'm just gonna shout them out um, because they are they're amazing folks. Uh, again, from from the actual Kotlin core team, they build a compiler plugin which allows you to um, do serialization and deserialization of uh, JSON, protobuf, Cbor, Hokon properties, all of these kind of things across all of our platforms. Uh, without any runtime overhead, so like they nice. they can pre -con they can pre configure all everything. They are not doing some kind of weird reflection stuff, uh, so they are a lot more comfortable than using like JSON, for example. And actually, while we're here, um, we can have a look at the I think it's called Ignore Unknown Fields. Hmm. Hope. Uh, let's just give it a guess because I don't so the, the the only funny thing about this is that no keys is what it's called I think man it is it is struggling right now 
<clears throat> Let me just give me just a second here. I need to pop this open. We're gonna have to go buy a machine to send to people. Like just buy some yeah. like fifty yeah. pound laptop that's like sounds like it's about to take off, but it's amazing. Send it to people's <laughs> houses. Like, all right, here you go. <laughs> Here's yeah, your. I, I... <laughs> <laughs> um so this does take uh, a JSON configuration. I'm a bit confused why it's refusing mine right now. Required JSON found unit. What do you mean? <laughs> Wait. Don't. Man. My my whole IDE is dying, so I can't really tell if it's if it's my fault or if it's the if it's the IDE's <laughs> fault. Uh, give me just two seconds here. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Take your time. I hear lots of thumps upstairs. I don't know what's going on. Someone's running, all excited. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> um. The fact that it ah, Is it dead? I think we're missing an import. This was the problem. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Ignore unknown keys equals true. Okay, and now I think we can just pass this config into our serializer. Ah, there we go. Imports. Uh, the downfall of many a great man. <laughs> so, 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 um. Yeah. By the way, note that when when I write things, first of all, I can just write top level declarations. It's a whole different story whether you should write top level declarations for everything. <laughs> no uh, judgment. No judgment. This yeah, is a safe but, space. Just exactly. Bring, bring but you can. Like... So so even now that we write like the model of our application, we don't even have to go to a different file. We can just start typing. Very um, so we can we can mark a, a class. Um, we can actually make mark the data class, and we call this uh, I don't know response. That's uh, probably a name that's already used. Uh, graph response. Okay. Um, and this is gonna have probably need to split this to the right so that I can kind of get a get a rough idea. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, and now we we can pretty much just just map the individual fields because what we're gonna do later is we're literally just gonna tell the, our our HTTP client return an object of this type, and you can see that immediately uh, our result changes type to graph response, which oh, means that uh, yes. we'll be able to access the fields here. So we'll nice. have something called value, I guess, which is gonna be a list of what are these users? Yeah, users. Okay. So we'll, I guess we can just ignore the the data context for now. Um, yeah, that's and just now for, we of course. Yeah, that's just for our data, which is. And and by the way, data. there's a there's a very comprehensive uh, set of SDKs. So if you want to work with an SDK in your favorite language, then you don't have to manually try to deserialize JSON to that. You can use the Java SDK for MS Graph. And that would simplify your life a lot more. Mm, okay, okay. And and to make uh, things more complex, maybe I shouldn't mention that, but the Graph SDK <clears throat> comes with its own uh, authentication provider, which means that you don't have to use MSL4J if you don't want to. Uh, you can just directly, okay. if you're only going to interact, for example, with Graph, then you can use the Graph SDK and its own uh, token provider to do that. But in, in most cases, you will have an app where your user needs to come in and authenticate anyway, and mm -hmm. then they may call graph. So that's where MSL4J comes in. Okay. So now we, um, I, 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 we're just going to build like the minimal example, because mm -hmm. I guess the, the interesting, the most interesting part would just be the display name. Uh, so we can just do like uh, rest.value, and then we can, do, we can take another fancy function, like we could do like join to string, for example. Um, and we can join this whole thing up and we'll, I don't know, separate them with like three dashes or something. Okay. Um, cool. And then hopefully if everything goes well, uh, now our client should know that whatever comes back has the format of this, this graph response, which is going to have a value field, which is going to have a display name in each one of the users. 
So I'm, I'm very much crossing my fingers here. Okay. <clears throat> I'm excited to see what happens. There they yeah, are. Yeah, we got a user user with display name. User with yeah. display name. Hey, look at that. Yeah. There are a lot of them. They just all happen to be the same physical person. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe maybe, maybe we should have put that on like those on different lines or something. But yeah. <laughs> uh, no, that's super cool. So I mean, it's not very. Uh, it's it's not. I do like the the. I mean, for just like trying to get something out quickly or like for exploring a library or exploring an API, like being able to just do these top level things quickly is, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's really nice. Like I think that, and, and somebody mentioned that in these, you can just run code in these scratch files or these scratch places too. Is that a thing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We, we even have a, a REPL for Kotlin as well. So nice. okay. if you, if you want to do that, um, I'm I'm not sure what the scope. I think that might actually. Let's see here. An illegal reflective access has occurred. Mm. Um, so yeah, you can you can define things and then, uh, again, I don't know, do do weird weird things and hopefully, <laughs> if if the, I think that just restarted in the middle of my session. Uh, let's let's try that again. Let's 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 see here. I mean, it, it pretends that it's ready, but the, the, the I'm not gonna lie, the REPL's kind of flaky sometimes. Yeah. Um, I, well, almost I like like like, uh, like notebooks, right? Like notebooks were always cool, right? So. No. Oh. Oh. So hang on, we do have a question. When should we use? Mm -hmm. When to use Spring Security versus Simsal for J? So there's some interesting parts to that. Um, Typically, in stuff like Spring Security, so Spring Security will have an authentication bit in it, right? So it'll have a way to sign a user into your app. And if you look at, say, .NET, you don't use MSAL to log a user in with .NET, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's all the ASP.NET, OpenID, Core, or OpenID Connect libraries that are already there. So those get configured, and then those are the things that go and actually sign you in. But then when it's time to go get a token, that's what you use MSAL for. So at its purest, MSAL is a token acquisition library. Uh, with Spring, it'll be similar. So like Spring offers authentication uh, authentication plugins, and that sort of like wires up the whole framework for session cookies and the fact that you signed in and all that sort of stuff. So it would be similar where if you just need to sign a user in, Spring authentication would handle that for you and you don't need them. So if you need to go get tokens, then you would sign a user in with, um, you would sign the user in with spring and you'd use them. to go get tokens for them. The one part to that is that there's one bit of interactivity where after the user signs in, M needs to help with going to go get tokens. That's going to be the key because, uh, in order for M cash to get loaded up so that, you can get to that token a little bit later on. MSAL will be the thing that has to go redeem that access, or sorry, redeem the authorization code, at which point it has to hand that back to Spring and say, okay, cool, here's our, here's how we log, you know, here's the user that we need to log in uh, so that Spring will write a, write a cookie and the user won't have to re-authenticate every, every time through. So, um, yeah, anyway, cool. Um, so, yeah, so... Well, so this is cool. I mean, this didn't even take that long. It's like, you know, 15 minutes, really, just to get to get our client to go make an HTTP call, get our token, and and parse it out. Like, it's it's pretty it's pretty clean. It's pretty simple. I like it. Yeah. Uh, that's that's kind of what, what made me fall in love with, with Kotlin in the first place, is that I, I can just be super productive with it and kind of explore things quite quite easily. So what did you... Did you, did you have, like, a, a preferred platform or language before Kotlin that you used? Yeah, so I it's like the I think the story is is kind of similar for for a bunch of people. I I started writing Java and I was of the volition like I want to write everything in Java, like everything. I'm telling you like command line utilities. I'm like I don't see why I wouldn't write those in in Java. Like that's sure. I mean, it's the language I know. It seems to have a nice ecosystem. Why not? And then at some point, I was forced to write Swift for like one or one and a half years. And Swift is a nice and modern language. Like, there's no doubt uh -huh. about it. Yeah. Um, but then at some point, I was like, well, I want to do server-side stuff again. I want to do stuff for, for things that aren't iPhones. 
uh, again. And I wanted to go back to the JVM, but at this point, like, Java had kind of been spoiled for me um, because I got used to all these all these modern <laughs> things, like, I don't know, like, null safety or, or just, like, really embracing higher order functions, all these kind of things. The, the, the fact that nullability is, is being handled properly, all of this. And I just looked for another language, and when I found Kotlin, it was literally love at first sight. Like nice. no joke. <laughs> nice. That's and, awesome. Yeah, that's that. That's pretty much the whole story. Ever since it's it's been it's been Kotlin first for me. <laughs> so it's been a journey, right? You went uh, through quite a few languages. Is uh, oh, is, I, Kotlin, I, is Kotlin your preferred one? So Kotlin is my one true love, one hundred percent. Um, but I, I think it's it's super interesting to look at other languages as well. Um, right. Especially, so TypeScript, I think, is really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, especially because with Kotlin JS, we're trying to build something that's kind of competing. So it's kind of good to know the space anyway. But it's also just a really interesting language. Um, it, it's the first time that web development is like possible for someone like me who relies on on statically typed, <laughs> uh, right. statically typed language and IDE support. Yeah, uh, I've done a lot of Swift, um, a lot of Java, and, and yeah, I've I've just tr tried to. I also did some PHP, but we we do not speak of this. So yeah, <laughs> loads of loads of different things, uh, and I I think it's it's important that you try other languages as well, mm -hmm. because it it kind of keeps your mind fresh. But when when I like I don't know when at three a.m. an idea strikes me. And I need to pick up a tool to like. Let's go and build this. Like let's let's bang out a prototype. It's gonna yeah. be Kotlin one hundred percent of the time. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. I feel you. Yeah, I'm a big fan of TypeScript too because I I I feel what you said. Like I uh, I started like I I don't do a ton of JavaScript, but I do like some React stuff and some. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess at some point, and maybe for a period of time, I don't know if this is still the case, but like React. Uh, or maybe it was Angular switched to TypeScript, and so there's a pretty good TypeScript ecosystem around React too. So I started playing mm -hmm. around with React just to to get an idea how it worked, and uh, and I actually kind of fell in pretty quickly. Like I felt like, wow, I could be really productive really quickly here, um, and and actually ended up liking it quite a bit. So, but now I'm pretty I'm pretty amped to start messing around with Kotlin too, because we definitely need to build an Android app because one of our one of our one of our regulars, Sahil, if we don't get him, if we don't show him building uh, building an Android app with Kotlin with B2C, I think he'll, I, I think he'll be done with us. So we have to, we have to do it. He's been asking us, <laughs> so we've got to do it now. So we don't want to, I don't want to leave yes. him, I, I don't want to leave him hanging too long. So, uh, no, this is super uh, cool though. So I appreciate you. So here's a, yeah, so here's a here's a fun little snippet that I just opened. So as I said, we also have Kotlin JS, and you can actually also build React apps with uh, with Kotlin JS. Oh, cool! Uh, okay. Looks looks a bit weird when you look at the code for the first time. It's kind of everything's kind of wonky. But this is the ex like an example implementation for just a timer component. It's not using functional components right here, but uh, those also would work. Um, and again, we're doing this this fancy thing where. Uh, you describe your uh, your markup, like your your CSS and your uh, your p tags, or your, like your div tags. Oh, you can describe those direct directly inside <laughs> the the Kotlin DSL, which again, like I don't know, or if you have like a, a styled button, something. It's it's quite uh, it's it's it gets it takes some getting used to, but we do this uh, productively for for one of our newest products so at jetbrains we develop jetbrains.space or it's just called jetbrains space which is a kind of our our team environment like it's ah, okay. our like all-in-one solution and the web front end for this um is actually uh, it's probably not this is probably not gonna come through on the stream but yeah the web front end we have for this is all uh, all kotlin js with react so oh, it's React cool. does, this, uh, does this transpile to pure JavaScript, and can you bring JavaScript into this file without breaking it? Like that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So you can, you can, in theory, you can even uh, I don't know where a good place for this would be, but in theory, you we even have a, a JS function, uh, which literally just takes like a, a it, it can literally take a string of uh, of JavaScript 
and you can execute it in line. Don't do it, but you can do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't yeah. do it. It's a uh, code injection. It's kind of that's kind of dangerous. That's that's like if you ever read like C code and and you you read a line that starts with like asm, you're like, uh oh, that's <laughs> yeah. like, you're like it's, yeah, it's not gonna be a good time. Abandon all hope. <laughs> yeah. So exactly. But, is there yeah, a yeah. web? Uh, so so is there a web assembly? Um, fork or idea or anything going on over uh over jet brain side with Kotlin? we're working on it all right cool it's it's in our plans um it's it's no secret that we are working on it uh we don't have anything to show for right now but we think web assembly is going to be really awesome yeah I do um, too. Also, yeah. also when it comes to just generally like the the whole idea of kotlin multi-platform actually goes goes really far because at the end of the day, like think think of the idea of like, oh, you build your library or you build your business logic once and then you export it as a JavaScript library, as a Java library, as an iOS library, as an Android library, and maybe even as a desktop library, all from the same code base. Like that's so, ex and then maybe even as a WebAssembly like library <laughs> for, mm -hmm. for high performance stuff. So there's there's a lot of potential there. I'm not saying we're there yet, uh, but there's potential there. <laughs> yeah. No, uh, that's so, cool. So, qu question. Where yep. should people go next? Uh, someone's asking, where do I learn about Kotlin.js? Is there a good starting point? Where do we want to send people to when it comes to learning how to work with Kotlin? Okay. So generally what I like, so if, if you are a developer and you mm -hmm. work with some other language, yep. so first of all, the, the number one address, kotlinlang.org, that's just where we have all our stuff. Uh, there's a huge get started button here. I don't actually know where that takes us, so let's just click it. Cool, that just takes us to how to create a new project. So that's probably not where we want to go. Where we want to go is the, the learn button, which used to be somewhere here. It's called play now. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I guess it's no no <laughs> longer learning and just playing. Um, well, my playing favorite... is learning, isn't it? Yeah, or right. You learn through play. My, my favorite way of learning uh, or how I learned Kotlin is the Kotlin koans. And there are like um, some exercises where you get, you get broken code um, and you get kind yeah, of some picture. information about mm -hmm. how Kotlin works in this scenario. Right. And then you get to implement it and you get to run it directly in the browser. Or if you can't find it out, you can, uh, you can see the answer down here and you can just go through these and by the end of uh, of going through all of the all of the koans, you will write already pretty idiomatic Kotlin code. Very nice. What does that awesome. koan stand for? Because I remember there was one for F sharp as well. Does it stand yeah. for something? Uh, I think they're like meditations, like ah. like short short self-contained exercises that you should repeat every once in a while, so that you like a uh, kata. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, pretty much. Yeah. Okay. I think it's I think it's very similar. Interesting. And then if you want to dive more deeply into topics, um, we uh -huh. also have the uh, hands-on tab up here and, and where we have... So if you are interested in, in Kotlin.js, we have the building web applications tutorial, which is going to be like, depending on how much time you want to take, it's like a 45-minute-ish walkthrough with a lot of materials where you build a full-fledged app. Also, more importantly, it comes with a GitHub repository. You can click on that. You can look at all the code. Um, you might recognize this face. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, someone and is, of, someone is uh, saying typealias.com is amazing too. Are you aware of that? Sorry, type what? Typealias.com. I've never heard of that. Let's look um, at it on stream. That never goes wrong. It's Dave yeah. Leeds. Oh, Kotlin. I actually I have seen this. I did not know that his domain was typealias.com. Oh. Um, yeah, I've seen yeah. this. I think this is quite nice for newcomers as well. Uh, okay. It's quite quite cozy. Um, yeah. Apart from that, I think at this point, with Google having adopted this, there are a ton of people who've created educational content around Kotlin, like from from zero to hero type type Very content. Nice. Um, yeah, I, w I would just, uh, the good thing is that most of the stuff that you find, even if it's a year old or two years old, mm -hmm. uh, it's still going to be just fine. Like the language evolves in a very structured manner. You're not like, the core of the language is mostly stayed the same. There's also a, 
Sarah course on Kotlin, oh. which let's see if that one, let's see. I think you can enroll for free. Um, I don't know why they're so pixelated. There we go. Um, they're hiding their identities. Well, yeah. When, when, when 98% of your CPU is taken up to stream it, you know, stream. you gotta, <laughs> yeah. so yeah, as, as we can see, there's a giant button that says enroll for free. Um, and that is a, a video course, which is offered by us and has over a hundred thousand views. It's done by our ex project language lead and, uh, Svetlana, who's my boss. So, you know, you'll be in good hands. It's awesome. Wow. So you got, you guys created a Coursera course for Kotlin? That's yep. amazing. Okay. Can I have one? Re All right. One request. Can I have Kotlin for .NET developers? Um... Kotlin for so C-sharp people, maybe. <laughs> we'll say that instead. I, as far as I know, the folks from KTOR, spoiler alert, they are currently writing tutorials. There's a... Uh, let, me, let me see if I can show this on stream or if this is still private. Uh, so... <laughs> the... <laughs> uh, is this a... Oh, spoiler oh. alert. No, it's all it's all good. Apparently, it's a it's a public repository. <laughs> is it really public? If I if I put it in a private mode, would it still be fine? <laughs> yeah, all good. So it's public. So I okay. I'm not spoiling anything here. Good. Um, good. and there's there's this thing here called ASP.NET to Ktor tutorial. Okay, which cool. Which is which is current currently oh, still open. There's... Oh yeah. Yeah. Yep. You know awesome. him? Uh, no, yeah. of him. It's probably the best way to. Oh, Cal Cal Yeah, it. he's very active on uh, on Twitter. Very active yeah, so, he, .NET, he, so he recently joined us as a developer advocate as well for our .NET tooling. Um, yeah, and at least a preliminary version of ASP.NET Core uh, to to Ktor migration is somewhere in here with a bunch of example files and nice. stuff as well. All right, we'll get Which it I out. hope will make your life uh, easier. I have, all right, so yeah. I've got one. I've got one more question for you. I mean, besides like ask. ask 10 more i i'm i'm here all night i'm here all week <laughs> so go ahead i so say i want to build something with like say it's intellij right i do mm -hmm. not i do not want to install a jre well let me no, let me yeah. be more let me be more explicit i do not want to install a, an oracle jre so a mm -hmm. does intellij come with one <laughs> that i can just JDK, use right there's an open jdk now you can so again, if you have if you have IntelliJ, you're absolutely in luck. This window is a lot bigger than I remember. <laughs> Man, font, font size really does things to you. Um, so if you if you go to your project structure or wherever you need to select a, a JDK, mm -hmm. like here, yeah. since a couple of versions we have this fun little button down here called Add SDK, and then there's actually a button here called Download JDK. Ooh. And what this does is you can select your vendor. So you can be like, oh, I want adopt open JDK 15. Mm -hmm. yeah. You hit the download button. That's going to okay. install that, configure that for you. Nice. You're all good. See, open so JDK if you want to install JDK. SAP SAP machine, whatever mm. the heck that is. <laughs> nice. If you want to now, now that's enterprise right here. Yes. Um, yeah. Or if you want to do like Amazon Coretta or something, I'm not sure if you folks are allowed to, to use that. Sure, why not? I mean, we, I mean, we've had, yeah. I don't we've know, had different, different cloud or something. <laughs> I mean, we've had you on for two hours talking about Kotlin and JetBrains. <laughs> so I don't think there's any problem talking or using Amazon. I mean, we use the we use the Azul Zulu, and um, uh, that's what our like. If you run Java apps in um, in app service and stuff in Azure, that's there. So, well, then great. You can just get the Azul Zulu community down here. Download that. It's gonna yeah. set it all up for you. No problem. So then, okay, so uh, one more fact, question. Actually, when you install, <laughs> wait, sorry, just, just just to quickly finish this thought, uh, when you install IntelliJ and it doesn't detect one, I think it even prompts you to automatically download. Uh, like, which one do you want? You don't have one yet. Mm -hmm. yeah, sorry. yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so, well, last question. What's the difference between JetBrains Community and JetBrains IntelliJ? Uh, uh, ultimate or whatever, or sorry, IntelliJ Ultimate and IntelliJ Community. Anything like that would matter for somebody who's just getting started? Yeah, one of them costs something. <laughs> um, that's, um, 
So, uh, by the way, it's e even that, depending on if you're like in university or school or something, that might not even be true. Because we, yeah, like, we offer. I was saying, you might have yeah. some student licenses, right? Or... We, we offer free licenses to so many different people. Like, right. whether it's, it's op if you're developing open source, you get a free license. If you're mm -hmm. some kind of, I think there's even if you're some kind of Microsoft recognized MVP or something, I don't know your programs. Um, then I think you also get free licenses. Like there's there's a bunch of ways uh, to to get to get free licenses. The main difference uh, that in this context I guess is that we have better Spring support in uh, in IntelliJ IDEA Ultimate. Ah, okay. So the the also you cannot, so that you doesn't can't mean do, that your code uh, is you can't do Spring right. You can't. Oh my God, I'm pixelated. You can't do uh, Java Spring if you're on Community. Correct. You can, you can, oh. but you don't get some of the fancy functionality that we usually have. So, for example, if you if you have uh, the ultimate edition, um, you get a fancy little window down here called Spring, which is going to show you like all the routes you have to find in your application, right. and and all the other stuff. But the the regular code completion functionality, the inspections, all of this, that will still work in Community Edition. That's lovely. I, nice. Because the, when I was comparing the versions, um, I saw support for spring was only on ultimate and i automatically assume yep. that you can build it but that's 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 fantastic no so so it's you can still do it it you just don't get some of the like fancy features and maybe there might be a situation where if you're not aware of the framework uh it might be like oh uh this this function is unused even though you annotated it as like a um get mapping or something but that's about yeah. it like your your code is not just suddenly gonna be like oh it doesn't work you can't build like the the play button is is vanishing or something, <laughs> right? So yeah. yeah, it's it's really just one of them has more support for it than the others, and the other big thing if you're doing like full stack development, so if you have a project that has TypeScript for example and Java or Kotlin code, mm -hmm. uh, and you want to open both of those in IntelliJ, uh, you're not gonna get support in Community. If you right. want to do JavaScript support or Python support, actually Python support, I'm not sure. But like, I don't know, JavaScript, Go, like all these kind of languages, yeah. uh, C and C++ maybe as well, those those you will need to get ultimate for. Okay, good to know. But, but again, if, like, if, you're, if you're a, like there are so many ways to get our stuff either discounted or, or free. Uh, if you are an individual, make sure you check out the, the individual pricing tab as well, because that's like 80% less than for, for, uh, <laughs> for businesses. Yeah, apparently well, I have a like, subscription. If if I didn't even know. I went. I went to look. Apparently, I bought Resharper because I bought Resharper years and years ago, and apparently, I mm -hmm. continue to pay for it because it's still here, and IntelliJ is part of it. So, see, isn't know. that great? Yeah, problem yeah. solved. So, well, cool. Well, we gotta. <laughs> so we got we gotta run because we somebody's gonna come in after us. But uh, thanks for spending your evening with us. Like, I, I know this is probably not the most ideal way to spend a Friday night, but. Thanks for hanging out. This has been awesome. I'm like super don't, psyched to go try some coffee. Don't go yet. We need to raid people. Don't forget. Well, no, we well we are. Uh, Instafluff. Let's go. Should we go to Instafluff or Layla? Well, we have Ed Sumberno uh, from Live Coders. We never raided him, so we might want to go there. He's doing some uh, Blazor stuff. Ooh, man, ever man, this is. I swear to. I guess everybody do, is that all anybody does anymore is Blazor. Blazor I'm pretty Blazor, sure Blazor, like. Blazor. Yeah. That's, that's all it ever is. So, all right, we'll go over to Ed, see what Ed's doing. So, um, hey, everybody, we'll be back on Monday. Remember, we got a Monday episode next week with uh, Claire yes. Novotny from .NET Foundation. That's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, Tuesday, we're going to have an Tuesday. Ignite watch party. Yep. Um, so, we'll come we'll not, watch not the Ignite. Not another dark one. It will be a, a closer one. <laughs> Just imagine a Satya keynote with a bunch of our commentary and sound effects. Doesn't that sound exciting? <laughs> Riveting. I don't know. It will be banned after this one, but uh, yeah, we'll try to keep it. Yeah. So, Thanks everyone. Anyway, hey, really we're gonna go over to we're gonna go over to Ed. Everybody have a great weekend. Be sure to reach out to us if you need anything, and uh, we'll see you on the other side. Bye, everybody. Bye.